Hello Booktube, this is Weekly Read. My reading week has been rather mixed. Um, I started the reading week finishing off Eleanor of Equitaine by Alison Weir. I read this for both Historathon 2023 and People April. A Historathon is a year-long reading event in which participants read um, historical nonfiction during the course of the year. Um, it's broken down into quarters uh, with uh, sort of a associated time periods. Uh, quarter two is 500 to 1500. And then People April is reading uh, biographies and autobiographies and memoirs and such uh, nonfiction. So Eleanor Vecquitaine is a biography of um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, she was the Queen of Two Kingdoms, uh, as well as the Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right. She was first married to Louis VII of France, and only bore to him two daughters, and so they um, ended that marriage. And she later married um, Henry of Anjou, um, Henry of Anjou, who. Uh, was at the time Duke of Normandy and later inherited the Duchy of um, Anjou and then later became King Henry II of England. Um, Eleanor was one of the most influential women of her time, if not in all of history. Um, and this is an amazing biography. I really enjoyed it. It was a great read. So. I'm really looking forward to reading more about the period, which I'll get to when I get to my uh, reading plans for this coming reading week. So that was positive. Um, after I finished Eleanor of Aquitaine, I read Nabari no O, Volume 3 by Yuki Kamatani. Nabari no O is a manga series that features uh, ninja in contemporary Japan. Uh, there's a young man named Miharu Rokujo who um, has an entity called the Shinra Bonsho uh, within him. The Shinra Bonsho is a ninja technique that allows the possessor a certain reality warping capability. Um, because of this, Miharu, who would rather just be left alone and live a life of indifference, making okonomiyaki, is thrust into the hidden world of ninja. So there are a number of ninja clans operating in the shadows of contemporary Japan. He uh, gets drawn into the Benton clan, um, who operate as a ninja club at his middle school. And the What's left of the Benton clan is led by his English teacher. Um, a rival clan called the Kairoshu are after him. They're basically the main antagonists, and they act as mercenaries. And then there's the Fuma clan and others. So one of the Kairoshu, Yoite, um, has a technique that allows him to shoot bits of his life force as a sort of a gun. And he and Miharu come to an agreement that will, well, I'm getting ahead of myself in that case, but they do at the end of the second volume sort of come to an agreement between themselves, which will, well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. So, so this third volume sees um, one of the other ninja clans who've basically become a sort of a temp agency um, approach Benton with a proposition that they will give Benton their secret technique scroll in exchange for an assassination. So Benton accepts and they go to a science conference where a number of um, students are attending and find out that the intended target is being protected by the Kairoshu. And this leads to all sorts of um, conflict and mock fighting between Miharu and Yoite because they're working together. 
And as much as I liked the first and second volumes, I wasn't as thrilled with this third volume. Um, I think the relationship between Miharu and Yoate is really the selling point of this series. It's an amazingly well done uh, relationship. But the rest of it, particularly in this volume, I didn't quite like all that much. So, I don't know, I think I'll give, um, I don't know, I guess maybe I'll give it the series a few more volumes to see if I, if it improves or what, or maybe I should just really go track down the anime, which I watched years ago and quite enjoyed. Although, not necessarily this particular arc. I mean, that is one of the problems with um, comics is that, particularly long-running ones, is that sometimes the particular storylines don't quite work out for everyone. But anyway, so there's that. And then on Sunday, I had hoped to reread after about 15 years, give or take, the complete, no, the collected poems of Frank O'Hara. Um, I had this collection um, years ago, um, about 15 years ago, and I read it and I really enjoyed it. And I was looking forward to rereading it after such a long time. And then I did, and I built on it. Which annoys me. Um, although that seems to be something that is... Okay, let me rephrase. So, a number of books that I have picked back up after years out of my collection... Um, that I've kind of got, I've gotten back and I reread or tried to reread, and they don't really, really work. And that's been true for a number of years now. Um, I think it was in 2020, I reread uh, Mysterious Skin by Scott Heim, and I read it in high school. I think it was a senior when I read it, and I quite enjoyed it. But coming back to it as about not quite 20 years later, I'm like, no, oh, this is, oh, what is. I was like, I immediately noticed a ton of flaws in that book that I just, I did not catch when I was younger. And that's kind of the same thing here where I'm just, yeah, the poems just didn't work for me like they did when I was younger. And I don't quite know why. I mean, I mean, I guess possibly my changing tastes in that when I was younger during that time period, even though, as I've mentioned several times, I Science fiction and fantasy have been, had been my preferred genre for a very long time. But for a period in my late teens and to my mid-twenties, I was also fairly interested in classics, canonical, modern, modern and contemporary fiction, poetry, and drama. But I fell out of that. And while, to a degree, it kind of came back or... I probably ought to just make a separate video talking about that, if I haven't already. I think I have. <laughs> a few times it's sort of one of my sort of recurring things is my rather toxic relationship with classics, canonical, modern, and contemporary fiction, poetry, and drama. But anyway, so I didn't get on with this, and I'm still bummed about that. But so I wouldn't be missing any poetry this month. I reread um, after about two years, uh, "Rain and Plural" by Fiona Z. Lorraine, and I didn't particularly care for this reread. So I'm thinking I'm definitely whatever 
mood I was in for classics, canonical, modern, and contemporary fiction poetry and drama, I'm probably passing out of at the moment. <sighs> Which probably explains why this. <laughs> so, um, so on Monday I decided I was going to hopefully Bill redeem Everything is Illuminated by Jonathan Safran Foer. Now, Everything is Illuminated is part of a reading project I've been trying to and failing to do over the course of 2023, and that is the 10 contemporary classics I must bail redeem. So, late last year, to recap, Kieran of Katie Books uh, made a triptych of videos in which he listed 10 classics he thought his audience should read. Um, the three are divided into time periods. The first is everything before uh, December 31st of 1899. The second was January 1st of 1900 to December 31st of 1999. And the third everything after January 1st of 2000. Um, Steve Donahue made response videos, and in Steve, in a, with Steve's list, he listed um, of his 10, I've had encounters with four of them, one of which I read and quite liked and agree with him on, and the other three I have bailed on. And that gave me a, the idea to this list, to select those three books as well as seven other candidates for contemporary classics that I have previously billed on to give a bill redemption to, which is um, when I try to reread a book that I previously billed on and successfully read it. So I previously have gotten to three of the books and they are Bell Redemption Rejections. So will everything is illuminated by Jonathan Saffron Four be any different? No. It's another Bell Redemption Rejection. Um, so what is Everything is Illuminated about? Well, it's about Jonathan Saffron Four who goes to Ukraine to uh, research a woman who um, help save a grandparent from the Holocaust. And during his uh, travel to Ukraine, he um, befriends a similarly aged Ukrainian man who um, is a bit of a character, who comes from a, a family of characters. And the, during the journey, they have all sorts of adventures, and there's bits of historical weirdness that's going on as well, and yeah. <laughs> didn't do anything for me the first time I read it, and didn't do anything for me this time. So, I first read, or had an attempt at this book. I really need to figure out a way to, like, I didn't read it, I build on it, but there isn't that sort of a attempt doesn't quite work so just go with re my when I first read it even though I bailed on it but let's not get oh. okay so I first tried to read the book in 2006 while I was in uh, San Francisco's airport I don't quite remember the name of it um and I did not like it at all I think I maybe I think I got past the first chapter, maybe into the second or third, before I gave up and thought, this is, what is this? And on my, this Bell Redemption after almost 20 years, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the opening bit is from Alexei, the Ukrainian's point of view, and it's rather annoying. And then the historical bits are just bizarre and off-putting. And I'm like, it's just pretentious codswallop. But anyway, so 
Mm, yep. Bill Redemption. Bill Redemption rejection. Again. So on Tuesday, I started Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World by Jack Rutherford. Uh, this is again for Historathon and People April. And this is a biography of, well, this is in part a biography of Genghis Khan, who was a um, Mongol chieftain who um, unified um, the various tribes of Mongolia and went subsequently on a, a spree of conquest across um, East Asia and the Middle East. So the first third of the book is Genghis Khan's biography, and then the later two thirds uh, deal with the Mongol Empire and how the Mongol Empire sort of how their the empire's innovations and reforms sort of laid the groundwork for a number of later innovations that shaped the modern world and how eventually. Uh, the Mongols, their contributions were forgotten or hidden, and um, how sort of um, anti-East, anti-Asian racism sort of developed. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about the book. On the one hand, it's an interesting sort of reappraisal of Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire, although I wish, I would wish for more depth. Um, but at the same time, um, Weatherford goes on some tangents and that just never quite worked with me. And in a way, I think there are more recent studies of the Mongols, uh, particularly the Horde by Murray Favreau, that I think does a lot of what um, Rutherford's doing, but does it much better and much more engagingly. Because some of Weatherford's stylistic choices rub me the wrong way. Um, so, anyway. So that was that. Um... Now, what will I be reading this coming reading week? So, uh, over the weekend, I will be returning to the Plantagenets, and I'll be reading The Restless Kings, Henry II, His Sons, and the Wars for the Plantagenet Crown by Nick Barrett. So, this is a history of uh, Henry II and his kids and their uh, continual warring with each other which I'm really looking forward to. I've had that for a few years now. Um, after I finish The Rest of the Kings, I plan on uh, contributing a bit to Aussie April. Um, there are, during the course of the year, a number of uh, monthly reading events and reading events tied to different months. Somebody really should make a booktube calendar. And I was actually thinking about making a video about that, but it didn't quite work out. So I might be, I might try that next week and see if um, anybody knows if there is a booktube calendar and if not, if anybody would be interested in making one. But anyway, so one of the booktube events in April is Aussie April. And I've been wanting to participate and read something uh, written by an Australian and set in Australia uh, for a number of years now. And... I finally decided to take the plunge, so I will be, over the course of the reading week, hopefully getting to Loaded by Christos Tsiolkas. This is his debut novel. It's a gay Australian novel um, from the late 90s, and it's about a young man who basically has a day. It's a very short thing, but I've been wanting to read it for a while. I think I actually have seen the film adaptation of this, but I could be wrong. Um, and if I have time, or if I bail, hopefully I don't bail, but 
with my track record, I probably I need to plan these things out. Um, I will be doing another part, another entry in the 10 Contemporary Plastics I Must Bell Redeem, and that will be The Blind Assassin by Margaret Atwood. Uh, this is her novel from 2000. It's about uh, two sisters who are writers. Um, I read, bailed on this, uh, about, I think 2000, 2003 or 2004. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, after I've done a bail redemption of it. Hopefully it'll be a bail redemption achieved. But in case it's not, I will be switching to manga for the rest of the reading week, um, if needed. So I'm hoping to, if, well, I am hoping to get to it at some point this month, regardless of what happens. Um, one Piece by Aichiro Oda. Uh, one Piece is one of the most popular uh, manga ever. Um, it's been around for almost 25 years now, and it's the story of Monkey D. Luffy, a young man who wishes to be king of the pirates. So he and his a crew of friends uh, search for the One Piece, which is a fabled treasure that is reputed to be that will grant its finder the title of king of the pirates. Um, I have this omnibus edition uh, because there are well over 100 volumes, and as much as I like the individual volumes like this. Um, as far as One Piece is concerned, I'll go with this. So anyway, you know, hopefully I'll get to this. And if I have some extra time, I will also hope to get to some more Naruto by Masashi Kishimoto. Uh, Naruto is, again, one of the most uh, popular manga series ever. Um, it's a story of a young outcast named Naruto Uzumaki, who has a demon sealed inside of him. And he wishes to become Hokage, the leader of his village. Um, and this is his story. So that's my plan. As far as uh, book to videos are concerned, um, I'm thinking of making a book, uh, making a book tag video. Um, I have one that I was thinking of doing a few months ago that I'm still thinking of doing, but I have another one that I'm also wanting to do, so I might kind of see about that on Monday. And of course, there would be other tag videos and uh, any other videos I want to do, and then, of course, there'll be weekly reads. So anyway, BookTube, I'm going on a bit long, so... I'm going to go ahead and sign up for now, so thank you. Have a great rest of your evening and weekend, and until Monday, stay safe.